Good afternoon, everyone from Alaska. Good evening to colleagues in the US and in Washington, DC. And good morning to our friends and colleagues in Asia. I'm Mike Sprague. I'm the director of the Polar Institute. And on behalf of my colleague, Shohoko Ogoto, Deputy Director for Geoeconomics and Senior Northeast Asia Associate with our Asia program, I welcome over 700 of our colleagues from around the world participating in this two-day symposium, Asian Interests and the Path Forward in the New Arctic. We're pleased representatives from Japan, the Republic of Korea, the People's Republic of China, and the United States are joining us for this important and informative discussion. I want to thank the Embassy of Japan in Washington, DC for their assistance and our colleagues at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and Oceans Policy Research Center. And as always, I wanna thank Michaela Stith, our program assistant and Jack Durkee, our program associate at the Polar Institute for all of their work putting this program together. Supporting our event today are a number of Wilson Center programs, including the Asia Program, Kissinger Institute on China and the United States, the China Environment Forum, and members of the Yordic family of institutions. And as always, my appreciation to HOA Railway and Oguna Corporation and the residents of Wainwright, Alaska for their foundational support of the Institute's work throughout the year. As we all know, we are witnessing the globalization of the Arctic. Once considered on the periphery of geopolitics, economic development, trade, security, and environmental issues, the Arctic is now a globally consequential, interconnected, and interrelated landscape. So as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Arctic Council, there is little doubt that the Arctic is rapidly changing. And as this new age of the Arctic continues to evolve, so does its global significance, with many non-Arctic nations establishing Arctic strategies, appointing ambassadors and chief diplomats to the Arctic region, and communicating their country's interests in the region in both formal and informal settings. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting three nations from Asia, each with their own vision and aspirations related to the Arctic, and each active in a range of Arctic initiatives and activities. As our overview of the symposium states, in light of common interests and prospects for cooperation in the Arctic, this international virtual symposium will convene representatives, scholars, and experts from Japan, the People's Republic of China, the Republic of Korea, and the United States to share their country's unique Arctic interests and policies. This two-day symposium is divided into four themes, national interests and strategies, Arctic research and environmental change, economic development and infrastructure. So we look forward to these discussions, but we'd like for you to be involved in these discussions. So please send your questions to us at polar at wilsoncenter.org, polar at wilsoncenter.org or on Twitter at Polar Institute. And that can happen very soon. And you can tee up your questions for Senator Murkowski who will join us shortly. But first, to begin the program, it's a pleasure to welcome Congresswoman Jane Harmon, Director, President and CEO of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. But before Jane speaks, let me say this. For over a decade, Congresswoman Harmon has led the Wilson Center to new heights, achievements, and many recognitions. She's recasted the programs and initiatives to not just address current matters related to domestic and foreign policy, but she's positioned the center to address future challenges. And at the end of this month, Jane's tenure at the center will come to an end, but her leadership will be felt far into the future. You see, it was Jane who enabled, supported, and has helped guide the establishment of this Polar Institute. Jane, thank you for having the vision to do so and for giving all of us at the Polar Institute a place within our nation's think tank, the Wilson Center, to conduct very important work for our nation, for the international community, perhaps most importantly for the residents of the Arctic. Jane, thank you for all you have done for all of us. I now turn this program over to you. Got it. Uh, thank you, Mike. That was uh, unexpected and a, a, um, a lovely introduction. But let's understand that the success the Wilson Center has enjoyed over the last decade has been uh, a team effort. And I always talk about Team Wilson. And it is Team Wilson that has achieved uh, recognition by our peers as number one in the world 
uh, for three years in a row in regional expertise. And our regional expertise is about to be on full display. Our expertise in the Arctic, our expertise in Asia, and our expertise in China. Uh, I don't see Lisa Murkowski on the, my screen, and I'm about to introduce her. So I just want someone to tell me that she's here. Is she here? Lisa, are you there somewhere? Jane, I, 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 Jane, I will, I will check. Okay. Well, let, let me just launch because that's what we do at the Wilson Center. It's 6 p.m. in Washington, D.C. It is, uh, I assume, 3 p.m. ish in Alaska, uh, where Mike is, and it is God knows what hours in the in Asia. And I thank you to our hearty friends uh, for joining us. And I know in at least one case, it's been very difficult to get into this. Uh, uh, Zoom event. So, so thank you so much. And to all those uh, participating uh, by Zoom from wherever you are, uh, thank you too. You're about to learn a great deal, and so am I, uh, on uh, uh, about this topic, uh, Asian interests and the path forward in the new Arctic. Um, as Mike mentioned, this is an event hosted by three of our programs. He also mentioned that uh, this is my last month as uh, president and CEO of the center, and it is uh, convening or opening events like this that has made my time here uh, so incredibly uh, special. Of course, I want to acknowledge Mike, who is a, uh, a, a an Alaskan by way of Brooklyn, New York, and Shihoko, who is uh, a, a, an amazing uh, a participant in our Asia program uh, as deputy and as uh, the person who knows most about things Japan, and I also want to give a shout out to our Kissinger Institute, named after 97 years young Henry Kissinger, uh, which is uh, all over uh, our programming on, on Asia. Um, so uh, let's talk about the Arctic for a moment. Uh, I come from Los Angeles. I spent nine terms in Congress representing a community that uh, is along an ocean. It's called the Pacific Ocean. It touches some of the other countries whose participants are in this program. I was very surprised uh, while at the Wilson Center some years back when uh, a friend of mine named Alice Rogoff uh, came to see me and she said, Jane, um, do you know there is a new ocean? I had no idea what she was talking about. And it took a minute for her to explain the melting uh, polar ice cap has formed a new ocean, not just a small body of water, a new ocean, which is a transportation channel, uh, a huge uh, international security issue, uh, uh, an environmental issue, an indigenous people issue, uh, and that many countries that border it and that are um, nearby, let's talk about Asian countries, have a great interest in it. I had no idea. I, I seriously had no idea. And it occurred to me on the spot, and obviously she was pushing it, that the Wilson Center needed to have a program uh, on the Arctic. And Alice said, I've got the guy, his name is Mike Strega, and the next was next, and now we have a vibrant Arctic program. But there's more. What else do we have? We have a vibrant Arctic Senator uh, named Lisa Murkowski, who represents not just Alaska, but I would call her uh, the, you know, the senator from the Arctic. She has, uh, with help from others, but been the dominant voice in the Congress about things Arctic. And she just recently got funding in our uh, defense bill uh, for a, a, a center on the Arctic named after uh, the late Senator Ted Stevens. Uh, I knew Ted Stevens. I served in Congress with Ted Stevens. I liked Ted Stevens. And I think uh, naming this center after him is a very worthy honor and legacy for Ted Stevens. And thank you, Lisa, for as usual, uh, being thoughtful and having a really sub substantive idea which you carried out. A few more things uh, about our program. In addition to Lisa, and I'll mention more about her in a moment, hoping to see her on my screen. Have we found her yet? I'm looking at Mike. Is she there? Is she there? Jane, Jane, not yet. She's coming off the voting floor, but if she's a little late, we'll go to Shahoko and then back to you. Okay, that's ahead, fine. Please. All right. Well, then should I wait and introduce her in a minute and just mention our speaker for tomorrow? Because we have a 
an all woman lineup here. We have uh, uh, for tomorrow, uh, we have uh, Minister of Justice uh, Yoko Kamikawa, who will provide our keynote. And Minister Kamikawa's longstanding expertise in Arctic issues is well known, and we're honored to be hosting her. Uh, uh, but today we have Senator Murkowski. And uh, if you would like me to just um, wait until Shihoko has spoken and then come back and, and, and brag about Lisa, that's what I'll do. So Shihoko Goto is uh, you know, an amazingly uh, important part of the Wilson Center family. Uh, she is, uh, I learned what I, much of what I know about Japan from her, just got a new memo that I'm about to read because I'm doing another Japan event with Shihoko on Thursday. Uh, but I've been to Japan uh, with Shihoko and I, I wanna thank you for your enormous uh, contribution to Team Wilson and uh, to this event. So over to you, Shihoko. Great. Thank you so much, Jane, for those incredibly kind words. Um, and thank you, Mike, um, for really putting together such an amazing uh, program and to all of my colleagues in at the Polar Institute. Um, we cannot emphasize enough that the regional order in Asia is in flux and competing interests in the Arctic is adding yet another element to stir the balance of power in the world's most dynamic, as well as most populous region. And the Arctic plays a key role in advancing the economic security and political needs um, in the region, but it has also become a source of uh, uh, competition on the nationalism front as well. We have a lineup of policymakers analysts and thought leaders who are at the forefront of defining the future of the Arctic. And the next two days will allow us to have a deeper understanding of the strategic interests of Asian countries, as well as the United States, all with vested, but perhaps uh, different interests in the Arctic. Um, this is, um, I was about to actually introduce Ambassador Bolton, um, but um, let me just say that our first panel will really delve into this issue of national interests, competing national interests and strategies in the Arctic. So I'm very much looking forward to a robust discussion, um, and I very much hope that Senator Murkowski will arrive from the floor. Thanks. Thank you, Shahoko. Senator Murkowski is uh, apparently dialing in at the moment. So we'll, we'll give yeah. her another moment or so. Uh, Dave, I, why don't I recommend, Dave, why don't yeah. I recommend you just introduce your panel, uh, introduce the panel and your panelists, and then Jane, we'll come back to you, and give, give Senator okay. Murkowski a moment. Is that okay? Fine. Yeah, that's fine with me, Mike, and welcome to everyone. Uh, it's a great honor for me to uh, be here and to serve as the moderator for panel one. Um, uh, we could not have uh, hoped to have uh, any better individuals to address the topic of national interests and strategies in the Arctic than the three people who have agreed uh, to be with us tonight. I'm really thrilled that they have all made it in. Um, and it's, happy, it's good uh, to see everyone once again. Before I introduce them to you and to turn the floor over to them though, I'd like to offer just a few thoughts as a way of framing this discussion a bit. Um, since the end of the Cold War, the Arctic has emerged as a region that is attracting great interest and not just among the people and governments whose nations have territory in the Arctic. A lot of the developments in the Arctic many of which are driven by warming climate, are of keen and legitimate interest to everyone, including to the governments represented on this first panel. Over the past decade, the Arctic ha has also offered an example of farsighted cooperation among those who care about it. I can tell you from personal experience that uh, Japan, China, South Korea have contributed significantly uh, both as observers at the Arctic Council, also in negotiations, both on the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement and also on the Polar Shipping Code. And those who care about the Arctic will certainly need their co continuing cooperation 
if we are to be successful in tackling the many remaining challenges that the region still faces. Um, our speakers tonight on panel one, uh, Mitsushi Suzuka, ambassador in charge of Arctic Affairs for Japan. Gao Feng, special representative for Arctic Affairs, the People's Republic of China. And Hun Min Lim, ambassador for Arctic Affairs of the Republic of Korea. Those of you who are interested in seeing their full biographies, I direct you to the uh, website for this event um, where they are posted. Each ambassador will provide some opening remarks. After those are complete, there will be time for questions and further discussions. And so as Mike um, Strega mentioned earlier, if you have any of you out there have questions or comments for any of the speakers, please send them uh, email might be easiest to polar at wilsoncenter.org. Um, I will stop there and Mike, I need direction from you. Do you wish me to begin with the panel or should we give Senator Murkowski another moment to be to join us? Dave. Thank you, Dave, very much for that. Let, let's give the Senator one more moment. Um, I'm just checking my notes here. Apparently she's dialing in. So hold on for one moment. I think we should begin maybe if, if it's okay, Dave with you, and then we'll just cut to Senator Murkowski when she comes in. So I, I apologize, I have to interrupt, but I think we should just keep going with the panel. Uh, Mike, do you want me to introduce her though? Talk to me before uh, you cut to her. I'm just trying to make sure we've got, got the organization figured out. Okay. Yes, Jane, I'll cut to you. Thank you. Okay then, so let me now turn to uh, the three panelists for uh, session one on national interests and strategies in the Arctic. Our first speaker is Ambassador Suzuka. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It is great pleasure for me to join very important and very interesting in symposium Asian interests and the path forward in the new Arctic. A, I'm rather new in this arena and I try my best to explain about the Japanese policy towards the Arctic. I would like to use very brief uh, slides to facilitate a, my explanation. I hope you can now see my slide. Yes, we can, Ambassador, please proceed. <clears throat> All right. Oh, so without any ado, I would like to go into the presentation. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to show you the recent a history of the evolution of Japanese a policy. A, and the year 2013 was a remarkable year for the Arctic policy of Japan when three major events happened. Japan was approved for observer status by the Arctic Council in 2013, along with the Republic of China, Republic of Korea, India, Italy, and Singapore. The second, the same year, Japan assigned ambassador in charge of Arctic affairs for the first time. And third, the most important thing is the Parliamentary League of Arctic Frontier Study was founded. This group of lawmakers has been acting as a driving force of Japan's Arctic policy and representing Japan's position in the international community through inter-parliamentary channels. One of the leading members of this group will be the keynote speaker tomorrow. Her Excellency Minister Kamikawa Yoko. Now, our Arctic policy is based on Japan's Arctic policy decided by the headquarters for ocean policy in 2015. In the same year, 
Japan has launched the five-year national flagship research project, Arctic Challenges for Sustainability. In short, we call it ARCS. That will be mentioned later. Our policy basically consists of <clears throat> following three pillars. First, research and development through strengthening the observational and research system pertaining to the Arctic region. Second, international cooperation through proactive participation in the formulation of international rule. Third, sustainable use of the Arctic. The third basic plan that oh, the third basic plan on ocean policy approved by the cabinet in 2018 emphasizes the promotion of the three pillars. The plan also mentions Arctic challenges for sustainability, ARCs, study the construction of an Arctic research vessel with ice breaking capacity with the development of new technologies such as on board autonomous underwater vehicles for polar observations. Next. Further promotion of international joint research in cooperation between the natural sciences, the humanities, and the social sciences. The third Arctic Science Ministerial will be co hosted by Iceland and Japan and take place in May this year. This will be an excellent opportunity to connect international ties in the field of Arctic sciences. Observational data from the Arctic region are of great significance in understanding and forecasting global climate change. Towards the success of the very first ASEAN meeting in Asia, Tokyo, I would like to request all invited countries and indigenous people's organizations for supporting our common big project. I would like to <clears throat> explain about the Mr. Kono Talo, then Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan made opening remarks at the Arctic Circle 2018 in Iceland which encouraged us to consider what an ideal Arctic for all of us can look like. Mr. Kono describes three basic elements to realize our ideal Arctic. First three, clarifying the mechanism of environmental changes in the Arctic. Secondly, pursuing sustainable economic activities in the Arctic while respecting the ecosystem and the life of indigenous peoples. Lastly, but not the least, ensuring the rule of law. Japan has been consistently and steadily implementing the science research initiatives in accordance with its evolving Arctic policy. <clears throat> As the details are to be discussed in the following session, I here only touch upon the outlook of the science research initiatives and how Japanese policies uh, in the field of scientific research has been evolved. In 2011, the Japanese government launched Green Arctic Climate Change Research Project, the largest scale Arctic research project setting four strategies, uh, strategic uh, <clears throat> research targets, including a contribution to the elucidation of the mechanism of Arctic warming amplification. This is green. And second, as a successor project, the Arctic Challenge for Sustainability, we call it ARCS, started in 2015, operated mainly by the Jap National Institute of Polar Research, the Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science and Technology, and Hokkaido University. 
In the Arctic Challenge for Sustainability 2, in short, ERX 2, which was launched last year, we are planning to further accelerate the collaboration between ocean and space observation in cooperation with the United States. This will enable us to get a more highly accurate three-dimensional view of the Arctic region and bird's eye view of the Earth. The data acquired by Japanese researchers are available to the public through the Arctic Data Archive System and can be utilized by many stakeholders in the world. In addition, social scientists are also participating in the ARCS Q project and will accelerate to give back the research result to the people living in the Arctic region, including indigenous peoples to understand how the lifestyle in the Arctic region will change due to climate change. Japan will accelerate discussions on an international framework for strengthening the international observation network and the data sharing system for the Arctic region, including the strengthening of the sustaining Arctic of the observing networks to, put, to fill the light, largest observation data gap on the planet. And this is the end of my very brief uh, presentation on Japanese policies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Suzuka. Um, I still do not see uh, Senator Murkowski online. Mike, I'd like to proceed to the next speaker. Is that correct? Dave, actually, I think we are now joined by Senator Murkowski. Okay. She's calling in from her phone, uh, uh, which is the above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, so perhaps Jane, if it's okay, uh, Dave, Jane, I'll turn it over to you to introduce the Senator, is that okay? It's fine. Uh, and I wanna thank the first speaker. I thought that was an extremely uh, interesting and, and thorough presentation of, of Japan's uh, views on the Arctic over the last uh, seven years um, from 2014. Uh, well, Lisa Murkowski must be on the phone, although it would be nice to see her. Uh, all of you should know that uh, this is the busiest week in the history of ever in the United States Senate. Uh, the impeachment, second impeachment starts tomorrow, and there are all kinds of uh, preliminary votes, but also around a new budget, the uh, Senate, uh, Vice President Biden's uh, plans. I'm sure uh, we'll hear about them, or maybe we will. Uh, for for a relief package, and all of this is happening at the same time. And it is no surprise to me that Senator Lisa Murkowski would do all of that and call in uh, to be part of our panel. That's what she does. Uh, I uh, she is uh, she was first elected in 2002. Uh, we overlapped when I was in the Congress, uh, and she is. Uh, 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 serves on the Appropriations Committee in the Senate and has responsibility, among other things, uh, for the Wilson Center budget. And so we have worked very closely with her on that, and we've worked very closely with her on everything Arctic. I was saying, Lisa, before you got on the, uh, you, you joined us, that I think you are senator for two things. You're senator for Alaska, you're also senator for the Arctic. And you have adopted the issues, made them your own, uh, it amazes me how diligent you are. I have been to the Arctic Circle Conference a number of times, and you have too, uh, probably more times than I have. And what's very interesting about you is you don't just fly in and fly out. You fly in, uh, make your remarks, and stay. Why do you stay? Uh, you're not making more remarks. You stay to learn, and you stay to contribute informally to the gathering. And it is so impressive to have a member of Congress who is so dedicated and, and so effective. Uh, you are the second longest serving uh, Republican woman in the Congress. The longest serving Republican woman is uh, Senator Susan Collins, who's another good friend of, the, of uh, the Wilson Center and I know of you, uh, but you are uh, someone uh, everyone notices. You are brave, you are fearless, 
I, I, say, uh, I say this about myself too. You don't get jet lag, even though you go back uh, home uh, frequently and to international conferences, you give jet lag to everyone else who's running uh, ferociously trying to keep up with you. Uh, it is so uh, meaningful to us and to me as I, as I complete my 10 years at the Wilson Center that someone like you has been in our orbit for all these years. We keep joking that we're gonna give you a badge because you show up all the time, but now actually you show up virtually so you don't need the badge. Um, but on behalf of a, a grateful Wilson Center, uh, we thank you for everything you do, uh, not just related to the Arctic. Uh, we applaud you as a, a singular, uh, one of the best senators ever, that's my view. And we welcome you to uh, keynote this gathering. So I, I think you're somewhere, Lisa, um, over to you right now. And again, with my personal thanks uh, for uh, friendship and for uh, talent and for uh, never letting us down. So Jane, I agree. Uh, we'll, we'll work with the Senator here offline and try to get her back in. As soon as she's able to dial in, I will, I will come back in, cut into the program. But Dave, why don't you proceed and we'll just see how this goes for the next few minutes, okay? Very well then. And I want to um, thank uh, my panelists, panelists on session one for their flexibility. Uh, let me uh, again uh, thank Ambassador Suzuka for that excellent overview of uh, Japanese interests and strategies in the Arctic. And now I'd like to offer the floor to my friend, Ambassador Gao. Uh, Ambassador Gao and I got to know each other quite well in the course of negotiations on the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, where he very ably represented China. I want to thank him for his many contributions in that uh, connection. And Ambassador Gao, the floor is yours. Uh, dear uh, colleagues and friends, uh, good morning and good evening. Uh, it is a great pleasure to, uh, to see all of you, uh, as, uh, meet our uh, friends, old and uh, new, here online. Uh, I would like to express my appreciation, uh, appreciation to uh, the Wilson Center for the kind invitation and to uh, Ambassador Bolton for the introduction. The presence of uh, Arctic representatives and ambassadors uh, from Japan, Korea, and uh, China here today fully de demonstrates the influence of, uh, of uh, the uh, Wilson Center and the uh, importance of the to topic. Uh, China's Arctic policy, uh, the white paper, was published uh, in uh, January uh, 2018. And I'm not repeating uh, the uh, white paper here, but uh, try to concentrate on uh, uh, some of the issues we are facing uh, today at this uh, critical time. So we are here to discuss Asian interests and the path forward uh, in the new Arctic. So the very first question comes to us is, what is new in the new Arctic? In uh, 2019, uh, in her speech at the um, Arctic Circle China Forum, in Shanghai, Senator uh, Lisa Mikorski mentioned that the geopolitical uh, location of the Arctic has not been changed. Uh, but with the uh, tremendous changes in the world, the Arctic is no longer what it was. As to the changes in the new Arctic, uh, I think they uh, include the following at least. Uh, first, the um, Natural environment is changing rapidly. Global warming has accelerated the melting of, of the ice uh, in the Arctic. Extreme weather events are increasing. Environmental issues such as the protection of biodiversity and the marine pollutions have attracted more and more attention. Second, the human activity uh, in the Arctic are growing gradually. Uh, with better development conditions, uh, the Arctic is becoming more and more uh, accessible for activities like uh, scientific uh, expeditions, shipping, uh, energy exploration, tourism, and, and so on. Third, the concern of regional situation is emerging. Voices on the threat and competition in the Arctic are much louder today. 
It threatens the, the, the long-standing low tension and the high cooperation situation in the Arctic. So it brings uh, us, uh, it, it brings us to the next question. What should we do to manage uh, these changes and the paper way forward? I noticed that Dr. Uh, Mike Sfraga shared seven C's as the seven key drivers shaping the Arctic region. Due to the time limit, uh, I would uh, use uh, uh, three C's to briefly share my views. First, climate. Uh, Arctic is a parameter of global climate change. The world is warming. Uh, so the uh, diplomacy on uh, climate and the environment. The past several months have witnessed the, the UN summit on biodiversity, the climate uh, ambition summit, one planet summit, and the climate adaption summit. We are also expecting the uh, CBD COP15 uh, hosted by China and uh, UNFCCC COP26 hosted by the UK later this year. I also noticed that the uh, US has announced to uh, uh, host a climate leaders uh, summit uh, in the coming uh, April. These summits fully demonstrate the political will of world leaders to address climate change. The world also witness, witnesses the sincerity and efforts of China in, its, in this regard. Last September, in his statement at the general debate of the 75th session of the UN uh, General Assembly, the Chinese President Xi Jinping announced that China aims to have CO2 emissions uh, peak before uh, 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before uh, 2060. Then after uh, President Xi further announced four vigorous policies and measures to scale up China's nationally determined contributions. Chinese people say honoring a, prime, uh, a, a promise carries the weight of gold. While making feasible plans to live up to our uh, promises. Currently, uh, a lot of attention has been given to China's 14th five-year plan and the long range objectives through the year 2035. There are concrete targets on emissions peak uh, in both the five-year plan and the long range objectives. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, the municipal government of Shanghai decided to go one step further and declares that Shanghai aims to achieve emissions peak before 2025. These concrete measures will definitely have positive effects on the climate in the Arctic. Last October, Japan and Korea also announced that their carbon neutrality targets. Uh, as uh, pointed out by uh, uh, Ms. Patricia Espinosa, the UNFCCC uh, Executive Secretary, China, Japan, and Korea are coming at the time we need this kind of leadership. And it's really a significant contribution towards bringing the international community in line to achieving the goals under Paris Agreement and will have a real impact on the level of uh, emissions globally. I totally agree with her and I think that the efforts from the three countries will help address climate change in the Arctic. The second C, uh, yes, is connectivity. Uh, connectivity is vital to uh, underpin the e economic growth and allow for the delivery of better services to uh, Arctic peoples. As early as uh, 2017, uh, when uh, David, you, uh, you were the uh, Arctic Council Sour Chair, the Council it established the task force on improved uh, connectivity in the Arctic. 
Now, uh, Arctic e Economic Council also established a working group on uh, connectivity. In recent Arctic Council meetings, there are a lot of discussions on uh, COVID-19. Uh, one therapy from the experts is to improve the key uh, infrastructure uh, like transportation and the telecommunication, uh, which will empower, uh, empower the region with high resilience in face of pandemic like uh, COVID-19. China encourages its enterprises to uh, engage in mutual beneficial uh, cooperation in the Arctic by uh, making the best use of their advantages in capital and technology. As you know, we are good at uh, bridge making. The bridge on the, on the slide uh, is uh, Hola Gallant. Hello, Hello Gallant Sea Crossing uh, Bridge uh, in Norway. The longest uh, spanning bridge uh, ever built uh, north of the Arctic uh, Circle. It's also named the bridge uh, accompanying Aurora. Uh, it's designed by a Danish company, and the main body was manufactured by a company of uh, Hobei province in China. Uh, its construction was done by a Sichuan Road and Bridge uh, Group from China, adopting the uh, Nordic standard. Uh, this landmark bridge was uh, officially open to traffic in uh, 2018 and becomes uh, part of a European route E6, which shortened the distance from uh, Tromso, uh, the gateway to uh, Arctic and the southern part of Norway and facilitates the uh, uh, north-south communications of the country. On connectivity, a topic of shared interest, perhaps, is the um, uh, Arctic uh, shipping. Uh, I will briefly touch on two key words. Uh, the first word is green. The energy saving effects of the uh, Arctic shipping routes. According to uh, the Chinese shipping company, Costco, uh, since the first voyage uh, in uh, 2013, Costco has uh, uh, conducted 42 uh, commercial voyages in the Northern East Passage. Compared with conventional uh, shipping, uh, the voyages are uh, 163,000 nautical miles and 508 days shorter in total, and reduced uh, 14.5 thousand tons of fuel com uh, consumption and 45.5 thousand carbon emissions, tons of carbon emissions. Uh, the second keyword is, uh, is rule. Uh, China has constructively participated in, in the process of formu formulating the uh, polar code and fully uh, abide by, uh, by it uh, thereafter. China supports the IMO in playing an active role uh, in the formulation of uh, navigation rules for the Arctic and is uh, ready to have more exchanges in this regard uh, within the framework of uh, Arctic Council and other platforms. The development of the Arctic shipping rules may experience various, various challenges and problems. However, as long as we stick to the mentioned two expects, uh, these shipping routes uh, would become sustainable, I believe, and contribute to, to the whole sustainability uh, in the Arctic. The last C is cooperation. Uh, the transnational and the global issues in the uh, Arctic are emerging. To address these issues, uh, cooperation among all parties, including the non-Arctic states, is, vital, is of uh, vital importance. I would like to take the uh, Arctic mi migratory birds as an example. In uh, 2016, David, you wrote to me as the uh, Arctic uh, Council Sour Chair to provide an update on the Arctic Migratory Birds Initiative, uh, 
uh, MB and invited, and invited China to uh, uh, join the in initiative. Since then, uh, my attention has turned to, uh, to this word, uh, the spoon built uh, sandpiper. It is one of these uh, critically endangered spe species in the world, and its population is much less than panda. China is an important stop for them to, uh, uh, to take a break in their long flyway. I'm pleased to see a sound cooperation relationship has uh, been uh, established between China and the Arctic Council CAF working group. The Chinese experts have, uh, have been uh, fully involved in the uh, formulation, assessment, and the implementation of the MV uh, 2.0. In December uh, 2018, the National Forestry and Grassland Ad Administration of China and CAF jointly organized uh, a workshop on the implementation of MB in uh, Hainan. In July uh, 2019, the Microtree Birds uh, sanctuaries along the coast of Yellow Sea Bohai Gulf of China, phase one, was uh, inscribed on UNESCO's uh, World Heritage List. The sanctuary mentioned in your letter, uh, David, uh, was included in the program as well. So this winter, I saw a lot of local uh, media reports on the, on the spoon build, spill, uh, build uh, sandpit hyper. They were in Jiangsu, Guangdong, uh, Hainan, uh, and Fujian, and other uh, provinces in China. I was told by environmental experts that, uh, thanks to the uh, close cooperation among the states, the vi visibility of uh, sandpipers in China has uh, increased uh, significantly. The Arctic migratory birds and the conservation of biodiversity is part of uh, uh, the many transnational issues in the Arctic. So, and China's action in this regard demonstrates what we can achieve with clo uh, close cooperation. Dear colleagues and friends, the Arctic is uh, at a crossroad with uh, historical opportunities. Despite, more, uh, uh, despite uh, some of the noises, uh, peace and cooperation is still the main uh, stream in the Arctic. China is ready to cooperate with all uh, relevant uh, parties to deepen the understanding of the Arctic, uh, jointly address the challenges uh, brought by the ch changes and contribute to the environment protection and sustainable development in uh, the Arctic. Thank you very much. Ambassador Gao, thank you for the extraordinary um, presentation. Uh, I've learned a lot about spoon-billed sandpipers among other things. Uh, it's my understanding that we may once again have the possibility of hearing from Senator Murkowski. Jane, I turn it back to you for a moment. I ask her, ask Ambassador Lim to hold on for just a moment, please. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. And I hope we have Lisa someplace, uh, even just I by think, phone. Jane, do you have me? Do, can you hear we, me? I have you. I oh, always, oh, I'm goodness. thrilled, and everyone is thrilled that you're here. Just let me say, Three things very briefly. Uh, I already bragged about you, um, but and I heard uh, the bragging. It was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, oh, you heard the bragging. But just to to pick up on what the last speaker said about peace and cooperation, the Arctic may be singular in that way too. That in a in a fraught world where there are lots of things to disagree about, including in our own country, uh, Lisa, you know this. Uh, peace and cooperation is possible in the Arctic and the, the eight countries that border the Arctic plus our friends in Asia, uh, all are talking about peace and cooperation. So just maybe the Arctic is the key to making the world that we all want. But now to you, Lisa, I know I said it already, but I'm saying it again. You are brave, you are diligent, you are effective, and you are a singular friend of the Wilson Center. Few people, maybe nobody, would finish, the, I don't even know if it's finished, the day that, that you had today leading into the week that is going to be a very tough week and make time uh, to call in or uh, to try to zoom in, I guess, uh, to this conference because you promised you would. 
and then you would stay on the line and listen to other people. This is what you do. And for those who think uh, that the United States Senate um, is not is is a disappointment, and I can give you arguments to say that, not everyone in it is a disappointment. And I I, I cannot say enough about your contribution uh, to your country and the to our country and the world, and how honored I am personally by our friendship and by everything you have done for the Wilson Center. So I'm now going to be quiet and listen to wisdom about the Arctic from, from the Senator with, with two jurisdictions. One is Alaska and the other is the Arctic. No one else is like you, Lisa, and uh, thank you so much. Well, your, your words the first time around were exceedingly generous and kind and then reinforced with a second time. So I feel like I've, I'm doubly blessed. And Jane, I thank you for that, um, but it's not just your words. What you have done at Wilson Center for the past decade, um, what you have built there, it, truly, in terms of the nation's think tank, um, what you have done as, as president, as director, as CEO is, is to be commended. And know that I so appreciate your leadership, your vision to establish the Polar Institute. I remember when, when we were talking about that, just saying we need to have this, this place. And you created that. You created an essential space in Washington, D.C. and abroad for a long, long overdue um, forum for policy discussions about the Arctic. What, uh, what Wilson Center has done in this regard, I think, has really elevated the conversation in a significant way. But it's also elevated the, uh, the, the role of the United States in the Arctic. And I, as you point out, I have been immersed in an Arctic uh, initiative uh, throughout my tenure here in the Congress now um, over 18 years. And uh, the eyes of the Arctic, I think are fair to say, um, the world is looking at us. The world has the eyes on the Arctic. And it, it, it has come about in in I think a relatively uh, short period where the United States has been um, engaged to a level uh, that others will say, yes, as an Arctic nation, they are stepping uh, up to it. So we've come a long ways um, and the Wilson Center and the Polar Institute has allowed us to have these forums. So I thank you. I wanna pass along my, my regards to Minister Kamakawa, who's gonna be opening the event tomorrow appreciate uh, her leadership towards uh, to Japan's Arctic interests and initiatives. Um, I'm just going to take a, a quick segue and, and speak very quickly about the relationship that, uh, that the U.S. and Japan have had on Arctic issues, and more specifically, uh, Alaska and, and Japan. We have a relationship built on trade that goes back uh, decades now, um, primarily with oil, gas, uh, timber, seafood. Um, we've got uh, uh, the longest term export contract of natural gas in the country was between Alaska and, and Japan. Um, in terms of the, uh, the research work that we have been engaged with since the uh, late 90s, actually since 1998, the US and Japan have worked together on, on methane hydrate research. Um, just this past year, uh, the USGS and, and GOMEC, the uh, Japan National Oil and Gas Metals National Corporation, established a site on the North Slope to, to do actual testing for methane hydrate. So we, we continue to work in those areas obviously air cargo tourism, um, but uh, I, I, uh, I should also mention that on the academics side, the relationship um, between Alaska and Japan on the Arctic has been uh, really quite considerable. And again, goes back to, to the late uh, 1990s when we established the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska. This was by way of an agreement with Japan and the United States. Um, uh, but also, 
Uh, I recognize that these conversations today are with uh, not only Japan, uh, but also Korea and, and China. Uh, again, very strong trade partners with, with Alaska. Um, our, our, our three largest trade partners are number one, China, number two, Korea, and number three, uh, Japan. Um, combined, they account for nearly 60% of our total export businesses. I mentioned the, the research and the academics we have with, with Japan, but we also have the, uh, uh, the, the research collaboratives with the Japanese National Institute of Polar Research, the Korea Polar Research Institute, as well as the Chinese Academy of Sciences on a number of different topics related to the Arctic. So again, there is a great um, history there uh, that goes back in so many different areas. And I think uh, when we think about forums like we have today to, to think about the role that, that these nations have in an area um, uh, of, of the globe that, um, that is far away. They're not, they're not uh, part of the Arctic as an Arctic nation uh, is described but they are certainly engaged in, in levels of activity. Uh, and, and that's part of the, the significant discussion today. That the, the global interest in the Arctic is, is one that is real and is growing. And you, know, you think about the expansion of interest that we have seen. Um, uh, the EU is updating its Arctic policy to reflect today's Arctic. Estonia announced its intention to join as an observer to the Arctic Council. I Ireland has uh, expressed interest. Um, you think about the number of, of Asian countries that have either Arctic ambassadors or special representatives to the Arctic. Most of them had them before the United States ha had ours appointed. Um, you know, we still don't have an Arctic ambassador. In my view, that's something that, that we uh, need and we're going to continue to push on that. But when, when, you, think about, uh, when you think about geography and, and how uh, geography defines um, uh, regions and, and, and borders, um, I think it is, it is fair to say that uh, geography has not uh, uh, discouraged other nations from looking to the Arctic uh, for, for, for opportunities, whether, whether it be uh, in the area uh, of shipping, whether it be uh, exchange uh, of research or what we are doing on environmental initiatives or, or, or climate initiatives. The level of cooperation uh, that we see coming out of the Arctic is something to be recognized and I believe to be, be celebrated. And to Jane's point, about the Arctic being viewed as that zone of peace. Um, throughout my, my years in, in working with uh, not only the Arctic nations, but those that, uh, uh, that uh, are very keenly uh, focused on the Arctic, it is, it is this common refrain that we come back to where it is in everyone's shared interest that, that we work cooperatively. Um, and and, and in, in a way and a manner that is peaceful. And so when, he, when you think about what we've seen in, in, in recent years um, uh, with, with interest by, by other nations about the, 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 the far north, the high north, um, there have been some that have said, you know, there's a race for the Arctic, there's a race for the resources, there's a race, there's a competition. And, and, and to some, it might make it sound like um, the, the Arctic is some kind of a wild west, that there's no structure out there, that it's been this place that's been frozen in time. And now as we're seeing, as we're seeing uh, the impacts of, of global climate change uh, and, and you've got shipping lanes that are open, you have access to different resources that somehow or other, it's, it's all a free for all up there. Far, far, far from the truth. There are, there have been, and there will continue to be rules and structures and norms. Um, and, and, you know, that's just the reality. And so I think we heard, uh, we heard Secretary Pompeo say when he was in, uh, in, 
in uh, uh, Reykjavik uh, last year. He says, you know, those who believe in the rules-based order are welcome. They're welcome to cooperate, to collaborate, and, and to participate. Um, you know, I, I, I bring up that, uh, that meeting in, in Reykjavik at the Arctic Council um, uh, two years ago, and uh, I'm reminded that uh, uh, not only um, the, the role that the Arctic Council plays in, in being this intergovernmental forum that promotes the cooperation, you know, they're turning 25 years uh, this year. Uh, that's, that's a pretty good long period of time to, to acknowledge the structure and the, and the rules that have been uh, put in place and kept in place to, to keep the, the region uh, cooperative and collaborative um, and peaceful. And, and so we, we look not only at the commitment that, uh, that the eight Arctic nations have made to that cooperation, but also recognizing the, uh, the 38 observer states um, including uh, Japan and South Korea, China, and um, the other organizations that appropriately participate in the in the council. I think this is a this is a tribute to the cooperative nature and the focus. Um, uh, there's also other organizations that are important. Um, some have been mentioned here already: the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, uh, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, other fora that recognize the need for cooperation like the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. So my point here is, is that the Arctic is governed um, and, uh, and, and, and we recognize uh, uh, its inclusion through efforts like the Arctic Council and the cooperative nature uh, of that. So as, as, I, as I mentioned, the, the uh, uh, Arctic Council meeting in, in, in Iceland, uh, that was one, Jane, where you had mentioned that I don't get jet lag. Um, that was one trip where uh, it, it probably got close to catching up with me because I began my, my, my trip in Iceland. Uh, I then proceeded down uh, to, to uh, the Munich Security Council um, for a continuation of, of Arctic discussions. Um, and it was there that the Finnish minister uh, uh, used a phrase that has long been with me. He said, he said that we, we in the Arctic, the eight Arctic nations, um, can't just put a do not, do not disturb sign out there and tell other nations, just leave us in the Arctic alone. Um, because things are happening. Change is coming. We are seeing that. And so how we, how we work to cooperate is something that we must do because the do not disturb sign is not, uh, is not a possibility for us. So uh, we, we are reminded of, of that um, again on a, on a daily basis. I left the, uh, the Security Council meeting and then flew over to Shanghai where uh, uh, my friend, President Grimson, had hosted a, uh, a meeting of the Arctic Circle there. And I was asked, why are you going to China um, when China is not an Arctic nation? And I made very clear that I felt that it was important to be listening and learning to uh, what others were saying about the Arctic, their interests in the Arctic. And as a representative from an Arctic nation, I think it is important that this level of engagement uh, go on. And uh, so I, I, I try to participate as much as I can in these venues and these forums, because again, I think if, if we want to have cooperation, we have to act cooperatively. If we want peace in a region, then we have to be able to have dialogue with people in the region and those who are not in the region, but who are watching the region. So I, I, I look at, uh, at again, the, um, the, the agenda that you have over the next couple of days, um, uh, those who are participating, uh, these nations have strong interests in, in the region. As I mentioned, 
every nation has appointed a senior diplomat to focus on the Arctic region, that is significant. Um, each nation represented has, has considerable research expertise. Um, I've mentioned some of that, uh, but in everything that we can add to our understanding of the Arctic region is, is important. Um, we have the international agreement to prevent unre unregulated fishing in the high seas of the central Arctic Ocean. This is going to enter into force once ratified by China, so I'm hopeful that's going to be sooner than, than later. Um, once the agreement enters into force, the nine nations, including the U.S., Japan, South Korea, and China, as well as the EU, will establish the joint scientific program. Um, so we've got an opportunity to leverage the combined Arctic research capacity of Arctic and non-Arctic nations for, for the good of the region and the global environment. Um, uh, the, the economic development opportunities that exist, uh, again, uh, we wanna do so in a way that is, is in accord with international norms that are transparent, um, that advance wise and sustainable development. This is what we all uh, seek. I appreciate what was raised about uh, connectivity. Um, uh, I recognize the, the strong role that the Arctic Economic Council can play uh, when we talk about infrastructure and a recognition that in many parts of the Arctic, infrastructure is so woefully lacking, whether it's roads or ports or again, basic broadband. Um, so I, I, I want to, to recognize as I uh, conclude, because I believe I've taken more than my time, I want to recognize that uh, we have um, the next Arctic Science Ministerial uh, in Japan, uh, co-hosted with Iceland. Uh, again, very significant and purposeful um, ties uh, to, uh, to these, these three uh, nations that we are uh, having conversations with, with China, Japan and, and Korea, uh, the fact that we have science ministerials um, in these other areas that are outside of the eight Arctic nations is, is so significant and important as we develop meaningful partnerships to, uh, to, to work together and, and, and work to, uh, to protect uh, the Arctic and, and the a life and the lifestyles of those who, who live in the Arctic. So, um, so much good that is, that is coming together and it's led uh, in significant part by really smart people at the Wilson Center um, that has been so admirably led by my friend Jane Harmon. So that concludes my remarks. I don't know why uh, we can't uh, get Zoom figured out on my end, but I apologize for the old fashioned telephone call and uh, thank you for the good work that you're doing. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Senator. That was uh, wonderful. I really do appreciate you taking the time to be with us um, and best wishes to you uh, for the rest of the week, I guess I would say. Um, now, if we can, I'd like to uh, return to uh, the panel. Uh, Ambassador Lim from uh, South Korea, you uh, deserve a medal for your patience. I really do appreciate uh, your willingness to wait, but now that you're, uh, it is your turn, we're very much eager to hear from you, Ambassador Lim. Thank you, Ambassador Bolton. First of all, I should uh, thank uh, Wilson Center for Institute and the Asia Program as well for hosting this very important symposium. And uh, I also thank uh, Dr. Jane Harmon and uh, Dr. Mike Spraga for inviting me to this symposium. And I'm also very grateful to meet with uh, my uh, the colleague ambassadors from Japan and China through this occasion. Uh, let me start with why Korea attaches uh, great importance on the Arctic. So, yeah, slide, please. Next slide, please, yes. Uh, the importance and value of the new Arctic as a key to solving global issues such as climate change and as a new economic opportunities is now well known to everybody. 
Basically, Korean Arctic policy is also based on these views. Then while every country shares uh, this same perception of the value and importance of this new Arctic, why is the Arctic especially important to this non-Arctic country, Korea? What makes Korea so active in participating in Arctic activities? Firstly, it is because uh, what is happening in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. The Arctic has a critical direct impact on Korea, like uh, severe climate changes on the Korean peninsula resulting from Arctic warming. Secondly, the changing environment of the Arctic provides new economic opportunities, such as access to new sea routes and natural resources, which are so critical to Korea. However, it is also because Korea hopes to join global response to the challenges and opportunities in the Arctic as a responsible partner. No single country can respond to these challenges and realize these opportunities alone. It is the perception that Korea is firmly committed to a robust cooperation among Arctic communities based on goals of mutual prosperity and collaboration in meeting these complex and interlinked challenges and opportunities in the Arctic. Next slide, please. Uh, first, let's take a brief look at Korea's journey in the Arctic activities. Korea joined the, in the Arctic community much later than China and Japan, but became an important partner in the Arctic community in a very short period of time. Korea first explored the North Pole in 1991, and only in 1999 did the two Korean scientists conduct its first expedition to the Arctic aboard Chinese icebreaker. More systemic Arctic research became possible when Korea opened Dasan Science Base in Svalbard in 2002 and built the first ice-breaking research vessel, the Aron, in 2009. 2013 is a very special year for Korea's Arctic activities. Korea obtained the Arctic Council Observer status in 2013 with China and Japan. And the Korea's first Arctic blueprint, named Arctic Policy Master Plan, was established in 2013 also. Since then, Korea has been conducting a full-fledged Arctic expertise and in 2018, finally announced the second master plan as well as its long-term blueprint named the 2050 Polar Vision. Next slide, please. Uh, partnerships. Since joining the Arctic Council as of October 2013, Korea has made notable achievements in Arctic governance engagement. It has participated actively in the Council work by attending meetings and joining in working groups and task forces. It has been also actively participating in other multilateral forums such as Arctic Frontier and Arctic Circle and etc. In addition to these multilateral partnerships, Korea is open operating bilateral consultations with six council member countries in order to make up for limitations of being on October. Korea also established the trilateral Arctic cooperation dialogue with China and Japan in 2016. Joining as the party from the beginning in the agreement to prevent unregulated high sea fisheries in the central Arctic Ocean is one of the most important achievements in the Korea's Arctic partnership. Next slide, please. The scientific research is the most active and important part of Korea's Arctic activities. By utilizing its own research infrastructure, such as Dasan Science Base and ice breaking research vessel around, Korea is actively participating in international joint research. COPRI has participated in many international joint projects, such as YOP, 
and the integrated optic observation system. And recently, the Mosaic Project contributing to global research of climate change. Currently, about 20 groups of Arctic expeditions are dispatched to Arctic region annually to explore various fields. One of the best known achievements in Korea's scientific research may be the world's first discovery of the relationship between Arctic warming and severe winter cold in the Northern Hemisphere. Next slide, please. Recently, economic cooperation in the Arctic activities is becoming more and more important. The new Northern policy, which is one of Korea's economic development blueprints in cooperation with Northern countries, including Russia, highlights the importance of Arctic economic cooperation. Discussions on economic cooperation in the areas of Korea's competitiveness, such as shipbuilding, marine plants, and the ICT are currently underway at a bilateral and multilateral levels. Korea also joined in the Arctic Economic Council in 2017. As a maritime nation, Korea is an important stakeholder in developing Arctic shipping routes. Korean companies made the first test navigation through the Northern Sea Route, NSL, in 2013 and sailed the route three times in 2016. Korean shipbuilding companies are also leading the ice-breaking LNG carrier market by earning big contracts, including the Russian Yamal project. Korea is also keenly interested in energy resource development in the Arctic since it is a major importer of oil. Next slide, please. Now, let me turn to current Arctic policy of Korea. The current blueprint of the Korean government's Arctic policy is the policy framework for the promotion of Arctic activities 2018 to 2022. It is quite similar to that of China and Japan as non-Arctic countries located in the Northeast Asia together. The vision of this policy framework lies in becoming a pioneer and partner in shaping the Arctic future. Pioneer and partner may seem to be a difficult concept to be compatible with. However, as a non-Arctic state, the Korean government pursues two visions together. During the five years of 28 to 2022, Korean government pursues 13 implementing actions on the four major strategic directions, which are the pillars of the Korean Arctic policy. They are firstly the promoting partnership with Arctic states and other participants. The secondly, strengthening scientific research activities in addressing common challenges in the Arctic. Thirdly, the pursuing mutually beneficial economic cooperation with Arctic communities. And lastly, strengthening Korea's capacity to pursue Arctic policy. Uh, you can see the 13 implementing actions on the slide. Korea also aims to link and coordinate its Arctic policy with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It is for this purpose for Korea to focus on scientific research to address climate change and environmental protection in the Arctic, as well as to enhance its capabilities to support Arctic indigenous communities. Next slide, please. Conclusion. As of now, Korea has been actively participating in the global cooperation in the areas of the Arctic governance, scientific research, and business aiming at sustainable development of the Arctic. The challenges and opportunities caused by rapid environmental changes in the Arctic are further increasing the need for Korea to participate in Arctic cooperation. However, Korea is also facing restrictions as an observer country. In particular, the recent escalation of tensions 
of the over Arctic may serve as a factor limiting non-Arctic countries such as Korea's advance into the Arctic. In this respect, I'd like to underscore the importance of discussion on how to ensure non-Arctic states' contribution in the Arctic Council. I believe that the Arctic Council as a leading framework of the Arctic cooperation would also achieve its objective better by recognizing the contributions of non-Arctic countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, very Ambassador much, Jim. Jim. Um, uh, and I want to thank all three of our speakers for uh, uh, presenting uh, such a broad range of topics. We have a number of questions that have come in um, from the audience already. And if others of you who are listening in wish to send uh, in further questions, you're, you're free to do so. Um, a number of the questions focus on um, a topic that a number of you have, all three of you actually touched on this uh, idea that the Arctic has been um, an area where countries in the region and from outside the region have been able to work together to cooperate, kind of a model for other regions in the world. But some of the questions also point out that at least in the last couple of years, a different narrative has started to take shape uh, with the Arctic as um, uh, an area of competition and perhaps great power competition. Uh, some of the some of the people who've been writing in say that uh, during the administration of uh, President Trump, the United States uh, focused on uh, the Arctic as an area of potential conflict and maybe downplayed uh, some other traditional uh, U.S. policy uh, focal areas, including climate change. Of course, now there is a new U.S. administration in office. President Biden uh, was sworn in um, less than a month ago. And the question for the three of you is, what, what do you see for the near future? Are we looking at a cooperative Arctic or a competitive Arctic? Uh, what do you expect from the new US administration? I'll start with you, um, Ambassador Suzuka. What do you think about all this? Ambassador Bolton, uh, thank you very much for your very significant and very essential questions about the future of the the Arctic region as a whole, and a, I think that a our basic principle of the a, 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 a Arctic region, a Japan as a maritime nation and a state party to the nations Con, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and Cross find the free and open maritime order based on the rule of law is essential. And same idea goes for the Arctic as well. Based on this principle, Japan will promote further dialogue and cooperation with relevant countries for most importantly, a Arctic Council member states and other observer states and also the communities of the indigenous peoples living in Arctic is very much essential. Why we need to pay attention and highly respect the uh, ecosystem in that. Of course, we are facing to the great changes, not only in uh, our neighboring uh, regions, but also especially in Arctic uh, regions. So we have, as you exactly pointed out, a challenges and opportunities. And uh, our belief is uh, the same that uh, we need find a free and open maritime order based on the rule of law. And uh, we need to collaborate for achieving that goal. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Ambassador Gao, do you have any thoughts about this uh, subject of competition versus cooperation? and the new U.S. administration's role in all that. A question to us. Um, I actually, um, I um, uh, would say that uh, most of the people, or bulk of people, uh, would like to see the Arctic uh, in peace uh, and the stability. Uh, just like uh, uh, Lisa Mikowski, uh, Senator Lisa Mikowski has just said, I think it's, uh, it's a great uh, statement uh, 
at this critical time to say that people want uh, to, uh, to see the uh, peace and the stability in the Arctic and, and globe. Uh, I would also like to refer to <clears throat> uh, Director uh, Dr. Mike uh, Safragas uh, article. He pointed out that competition in the article uh, in the Arctic is real, uh, but not unmanageable uh, yet. <laughs> Um, I would also like to refer to um, our counterpart, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, Nikolai uh, uh, Kuchinov, uh, the Russian ambassador for uh, Arctic Cooperation. Uh, he said that uh, there are no problems requiring a military solution in the Arctic. And I agree with them, all of them. We also see several uh, solutions by uh, the European Union calling for all parties to work together to maintain the low tension and high cooperation situation in the Arctic. Uh, I think this is the <clears throat> common uh, aspiration of all, uh, basically all parties. Indeed, Arctic has long been uh, featured by uh, its uh, low tension, high cooperation, uh, situation. It it has been, uh, it has been the geopolitical situation for uh, many decades ahead of us, uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Arctic states uh, and other states. Uh, I wish to, uh, I I, um, uh, I wish to, and I think we can continue this situation in the Arctic. Uh, and and uh, we are saying that. We are facing a new uh, Arctic and uh, a lot of changes there. And by multilateral uh, approaches, we can deal with all of them. And later, we, uh, uh, I, uh, in my speech, I already mentioned many of them already. Yes. And in the history, we have dealt with them successfully, including the fishery agreement. Uh, David, you, lead the, uh, you led the uh, process very successfully. And so many of them, uh, I, I'm not uh, going to mention them uh, one by one, but the history approves that by multilateral approaches. We can do that. We can do that. So that is a, a workable uh, approach. And we, will, we want to see that we go back to the situation that we use this approach and deal with all of the questions we are facing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Gao. That was very well said. Ambassador Lim, do you have thoughts about uh, this, this topic? Mm, yes. Uh, actually, that I don't have much to add, but um, uh, the, the, the recent concern about the power competition in the Arctic uh, is uh, mainly caused by the, uh, the, the changes, the, the environment in the Arctic. Uh, and uh, this concern also uh, the, the, the include some of the concerns of the conflict, uh, which is very unnecessary and uh, which has never been in these this reasons. But uh, at the same time, when I, while I'm sharing uh, the, the, this concern, but at the same time, I also think uh, maybe this concern is a little bit exaggerated as well. Uh, the when the, this change in the environment of the Arctic uh, happens, we could very easily anticipate that uh, how the, the countries will react to these changes. And, uh, the, 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 and also the recent uh, the, the, the very active engagement of the, the great powers in this region there is also uh, the aiming uh, mainly for the economic engagement as well. So the, the and also the, the Arctic Council has dealt uh, this uh, all the issues in, in the in the Arctic region uh, very wisely by compartmentalizing the high policy issues, and uh, this very wonderful tradition will work. Uh, the, as well in the future. Uh, so the, 
the when I consider the all these uh, phenomena together, the I have uh, some the positive and uh, uh, the optimistic views on the future of the Arctic, which will uh, pay more attention to the, the economic uh, development of the region. Thank you, Ambassador. I do agree that the Arctic Council has been successful in part by being able to compartmentalize um, things. Uh, and we have a number of questions about the Arctic Council. When I was most involved with the Arctic Council during the US chairmanship, the most recent US chairmanship, um, I heard from a number of the observer states, including yours, all of yours, uh, some frustration that um, uh, countries like uh, countries in Asia, particularly Japan, China, Korea, also Singapore and India, wanted to have more influence as observers. They felt a little bit frustrated that the council was all well and fine, but um, they want uh, your governments wanted to have just a little bit more say in, in what goes on. I'm wondering if you if you had your uh, if you had your way, would the Arctic Council change in any particular way to allow more influence by observer states, for example, or do you think it's okay now more or less the way it is? And I uh, offer that question to any of you who may wish uh, to respond. Yes, Ambassador Gao. Thank you, David. <clears throat> um, yes, I think uh, positive uh, changes has been uh, taken place uh, gradually in the, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, your, during your uh, chairmanship, um, you started uh, to uh, have bre had breakfast with, us, with the observers and have the uh, breakfast uh, uh, kind of session <laughs> uh, many times. Yes. And I uh, still uh, remember that vividly uh, in uh, Fairbanks. And later, uh, during the Finnish uh, chairmanship, uh, an agenda item has been included officially in the, in the, in the agenda that to, uh, to allow uh, observers to uh, take the floor one by one on specific topics. I think that is a very a positive uh, uh, kind of development and uh, all are appreciated by uh, all the uh, observers. Uh, I'm pleased to see the council uh, attached uh, more and more importance to the role of the uh, observers, uh, especially because that we are, the, the problems we are facing, the, the, the issues we are uh, facing need more collective uh, actions including uh, so many, uh, climate change, not to say climate change, but uh, migratory birds, but uh, plastics, all of these we are dealing with are kind of, uh, I would say, uh, global issues. We're even uh, looking at uh, Australia and even New Zealand, although they are not observed, but uh, for the migratory birds, uh, these are relevant countries. Yes. So we, so we, are kind of uh, facing a, a kind of changing world, so we need to broaden our, our vision and uh, broaden our structure to allow all these uh, questions, uh, problems be addressed. By whom? By countries. By countries in, in uh, appropriate ways. I, I think uh, 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 the, the Arctic Council is facing this kind of problem, and then we need to catch up with all of these. Uh, of course, there are uh, other issues like uh, uh, financial burden, and uh, you mentioned that in uh, to, uh, 2018 in, in uh, Norway, in, in uh, Tromsø. So these kind of things, so well, we, 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 we could uh, uh, address them one by one. And uh, I, 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 I firmly believe that we can find constructive ways to really deal with all, the, all those questions when we have the opportunity to meet uh, face to face or otherwise online. So one by one, all these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Gao. Um, yes, Ambassador Suzuka, you have some thoughts on this, please. Thank you very much for giving me a floor. A, our 
thought, basic thought is very much clear and respect the basic principles of the Arctic Council, believing sustainable economic activities should be pursued with due consideration of the vulnerable Arctic ecosystem as well as the lives of the indigenous people. Without these very important factors, we are going to face the difficulties. With that in mind, Japan has proactively been promoting international cooperation in the framework of the Arctic Council, as well as with relevant countries like all member states, China, South Korea, by leveraging our strengths in scientific research. So this is a very important part is a Japan, same as the other observer countries can make contributions to a better future of the Arctic through proactive participation in the working groups and task forces of the Arctic Council and through bilateral and multilateral dialogues with Arctic Council member states. Japan can also contribute to the Arctic Council's decision-making processes by providing highly accurate scientific data and technical inputs based on scientific insights. Japan mm. has been pursuing research out outcomes for entire international community in cooperation with the Arctic Council member states and relevant countries through its unique research initi initiatives, as I pointed out in my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Lim, do you have something you wish to add? Yes, please. Thank you, Ambassador Bolton. Uh, the, the, the most important challenges that the, the Arctic Council is now facing must be the, the areas the, the, in which the Arctic Council should deal with is now expanding very, very, uh, very speedily. Uh, so that's the reason why the, 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 all the observer countries uh, should feel the, the, their engagement with the Arctic Council should be expanded. Uh, and so the, the, when these kind of new areas, which need uh, new norms and regulations increases, the, it is very clear that uh, the, 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 the regime for the Arctic reason, the, which is now based on the Arctic Council mainly, uh, should be developed, maybe should be changed. Uh, but uh, for the time being, the, there should be a very active internal discussions within the Arctic framework, uh, Arctic Council framework. But uh, the, we also need to be uh, the ready to discuss uh, more open and uh, more inclusive uh, discussions, how to, how to uh, develop uh, this framework uh, for uh, the, 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 not only the Arctic and uh, non-Arctic countries within the framework of the Arctic Council, but also the, the whole global communities. Because the, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay, doesn't stop in the Arctic. It, it, it impacts to whole global. And uh, the, the very clearly, the, the, the high seas in the, the Arctic region does not belong to the only the Arctic countries. So the, the every country uh, will be related with the discussion of, of the, the, this, uh, the Arctic region. And uh, so the, I think of the, the fisheries agreement, which was being the, the, the finalized recently, the, the among the five coastal countries, coastal, coastal the, the, the Arctic countries, as well as um, uh, Korea, China, and Japan, and the EU as well. Uh, it's a very, very good sample the how this resin should be involved in responding to, to this new situation. Uh, so the Korea is too ready uh, to play uh, to play a role as a responsible partner 
in, in shaping some, some better, better future and uh, the better residents for the sustainable development of our team. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much uh, for that, Ambassador Lim. We are basically out of time, um, but I want to ask Ambassador Gao just a very quick question. Uh, Senator Murkowski and some of the people who've been writing in want to know, and I want to know, what is your expectation about when China might be able to complete the ratification process for the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement that would allow it to enter into force? Thank you, uh, David, uh, for uh, raising this question. Yes, um, this agreement uh, is a, a milestone achievement uh, of the 10 uh, parties under your leadership. Uh, it provides a legal basis for um, uh, unregulated uh, fisheries and relevant uh, scientific research uh, activities in the Central Arctic Ocean. So people uh, uh, are interested in the approval uh, procedure. I, I would like to note that China has no political obstacle uh, for the uh, final approval. Uh, the only, only matter is, is time and uh, uh, our internal procedure. So we are um, uh, actively advancing the approval uh, process. Uh, the uh, competent, uh, competent authority uh, of the State Council of China is now um, reviewing the content uh, of the agreement uh, and its relations uh, with, uh, with, uh, within our legal system. Uh, yes, that's the status of uh, the agreement uh, uh, with us. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I do want to mention that uh, actually informal consultations are now uh, going on in uh, different ways. So uh, we are preparing for the final entry into force of the agreement. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Ambassador Gao. And you know, if we were all together instead of in this virtual setting, if we we're all together in an auditorium, I would ask the audience now to join me in a round of applause for all three of you for your excellent presentations and for your willingness to answer these questions. I'm only sorry we don't have more time, but I'm afraid we are now actually over time. And so to everyone who is listening in, uh, please join me in thanking Ambassador Suzuka, Ambassador Gao, Ambassador Lim. And now we will have a five minute break and we will resume uh, with session two at 10 minutes before the hour. And it's been a pleasure serving as your moderator for this session. I look forward to listening in on the next session in five minutes. Thank you all very much. Welcome back everyone. I want to thank uh, Dave and that wonderful panel uh, of ambassadors uh, for that exceptional discussion of course, I also want to thank Senator Murkowski for taking time out of her busy day and evening to spend a, more than a few moments with us and her insights. And again, I want to thank Jane Harmon for also joining us this evening and in the morning uh, in, in Asia. Uh, I want to thank all of my colleagues for your patience as we work through the new world that we live in with all of its technical. Uh, but since for your insights already today, uh, this afternoon and this evening, uh, I have written several pages of notes, reflections from your insights and your perspective. So it's very much appreciated. And I know the hundreds watching are also appreciating your insights as well. With that, let me turn the next panel over to the able leadership of Evan Bloom. He is a senior fellow at the Polar Institute, the Wilson Center. He served as the uh, acting deputy assistant secretary for oceans and fisheries. And he also served as the director for ocean and polar affairs at the US Department of State, and he will lead a panel discussion on Arctic research and environmental change in the Arctic. Evan, the floor is yours, and thank you once again for your leadership. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, and thank you all uh, for joining us for this important and I think a timely discussion about a topic of considerable international interest, Arctic research and environmental change in the Arctic. Uh, this evening or morning, depending on where you are, we have a fantastic group of prominent experts representing key Asian institutions, as well as the US National uh, Science Foundation, who will be speaking about Arctic science. Science collaboration goes to the heart of Arctic cooperation. When we talk about what countries are doing in the Arctic, 
and how they can work together, we inevitably talk about science. And Arctic science has never been just for countries with territory in the Arctic. It has always been an international effort. That has been especially true as scientists attempt to unravel the mysteries of climate change, undertaking work that in many cases can only be done in the polar regions. The 2020 Arctic report card issued by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration makes clear that the transformation of the Arctic to a warmer, less frozen and biologically changed region is well underway. There is a vital need to understand why that is the case. The new Biden administration has made climate change a national priority for domestic and international policy. So I think this is likely to result in a recommitment by the United States to polar science with considerable urgency. Asian countries have been leaders in Arctic science, mounting expeditions and participating in numerous national and joint programs. Many have located activities in, for example, Nialesund in, in Svalbard. They have played a pivotal role in Mosaic, the year round uh, use of Germany's polar stern vessel as a drifting observatory in the Arctic pack ice to research climate change. They have participated actively in the technical working groups of the Arctic Council as has already been mentioned. When the eight Arctic states of the Arctic Council were developing their agreement on enhancing international Arctic science cooperation, Asian states were actively involved as observers to ensure that the agreement would facilitate their science efforts. So we're lucky to have uh, representatives with considerable expertise from three major Asian states and that are key uh, players in Arctic science, as well as a US official who plays a leading role in polar science cooperation which e with each of those countries. Um, during this se session, I hope we can learn about the Arctic science priorities of China, South Korea, Japan, and the US and how they collaborate internationally. In, particularly, uh, in particular, I hope we can focus on work related to climate change, which is so important for the entire global community. So I'm going to ask each pan panelist for, to speak for up to 10 uh, minutes each. After all four have spoken, there will be an opportunity to address some questions uh, to, the, to them. If you have a question that's been mentioned before, please email that question to polar at wilsoncenter.org or tweet to at Polar Institute. Those questions will then be assembled and sent to me so I can pose them to relevant panelists. So for reasons of time, I'll give only a very brief introduction, uh, but fuller biographies of these speakers can be found on the Wilson Center website. So the, the, the four uh, speakers uh, are as follows. Um, Dr. Atsushi Tsunami is the president of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, as well as the president of the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace, Fo Peace Foundation. Uh, he is director of the CIREC Center and executive advisor to the president of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies and a guest professor at Waseda University. Uh, he is very active in advising the Japanese government on space policy, and he holds degrees from Georgetown and Columbia Universities. Dr. Yung Cho Shin is a biological oceanographer by training, and he's participated in co coordinating numerous expeditions to the Arctic and the Antarctic. He served on the Korean delegation during the negotiations of the uh, Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, which we've already uh, discussed in various ways, and has been a delegate to the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meetings, where I work with him, and he's a delegate to the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. Uh, he is currently the Vice President of uh, COPRI and is ex officio the Chief Scientist of, the, of that institute. Dr. Wigen Yang is a research professor and former director general of the Polar Research Institute of China. He is also director of the China Nordic Arctic Research Center. 
Uh, he got his uh, PhD uh, in space physics at Wuhan University in China and did his postdoc fellowship at the National Institute of Polar Research. Like Dr. Shin, he has worked extensively at both poles, having wintered over at Sh Japan's Showa base in Antarctica, and he was the first station leader of the Chinese Yellow River stationed at Nialison. And finally, Dr. Kelly Faulkner is the director of the Office of Polar Programs at the US National Science Foundation and serves as director of the US Antarctic Program. Dr. Faulkner oversees programs covering scientific research and logistics programs in both the Arctic and Antarctic. She currently serves as the chair of the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs and is a member of the US delegation to the Antarctic Treaty and was head of the delegation that successfully uh, ne negotiated the 2017 Arctic Science Cooperation Agreement. So with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Su Tsunami for his presentation. Dr. Tsunami. Thank you, Mr. Bloom. Um, and uh, for that kind introduction. And the first I'd like to, uh, let's see, try to share my slides. Uh, is that that works. Yeah, I guess. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, first, as a president of uh, Sasaka Peace Foundation, I'd like to thank the uh, uh, Wilson Center for hosting this very uh, important event. Uh, on the Arctic uh, cooperation and, and the world of Asian states. And, and uh, in particular, as the uh, uh, Sasaka Peace Foundation, we have been working very uh, closely with the uh, uh, Wilson Center on the various exchange programs, including the Japan Scholar Program uh, over the years. And uh, now we, uh, I'm happy to include the Polar Institute as a part of our cooperation with the Wilson Center. And of course, uh, Director Spraga and I go back uh, where he was at the uh, University of uh, Alaska, uh, an IARC Center where we have uh, first held the bilateral uh, workshop on the Arctic cooperation between US and Japan. And uh, we have been discussing this issue um, over the years and to bring the um, much uh, uh, the cooperation between the US and Japan and the Arctic uh, much closer. Uh, and uh, now that uh, with a new institute in the Wilson Center, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to work with the Wilson Center and Polar Institute uh, uh, and to advance our uh, cooperation or in the uh, Arctic research and, and include uh, uh, our uh, uh, long time sort of history of cooperation with the University of Alaska, Fairbanks and IARC uh, between US and Japan. And uh, first I'd like to take this opportunity to just a little bit to explain uh, our uh, uh, Polar and Arctic uh, science research program that are, we are launching at the moment in Japan. Um, and, but before I do that, uh, you know, um, our institute, the Ocean Policy Research Institute of Sasaka Peace Foundation, work very closely with the, uh, our Polar National Institute of Polar Research and also the uh, JAMSTEC and the Hokkaido University who are leading the, our Arctic uh, uh, science program uh, uh, as a sort of a common platform for a, a dialogue between science and an interface with science and, uh, and a governance and, and, and policy dialogue. And um, as the, uh, we are the only sort of a unique uh, think tank in Japan on dedicated to ocean research, uh, ocean policy research, we have uh, Arctic is a very important area that, uh, that we have been working for years. Um, Ambassador Suzuka already mentioned a history, a brief history of uh, Japan's uh, contribution in the Arctic, uh, including the, uh, some of the, our efforts in the Arctic policy. Um, right now, the uh, Japan's three specific initiatives uh, in the Arctic uh, policy is, of course, is 
first with the research and development, and its second international cooperation, and third is sustainable use. Uh, uh, and uh, so I wanted to focus on the research and development uh, component of the Arctic policy and this panel. Uh, and, in, in, and of course, um, these are some of the uh, important uh, topics that we, we are uh, developing in the research and development for Arctic uh, research. Uh, and, um, and the first is, of course, uh, strengthening the observation and analysis systems and developing the most advanced observation instrument. And I later, I just wanted to briefly introduce our new effort of uh, building a new icebreaker for the uh, international research uh, platform. But uh, uh, these are very important area from the beginning of uh, uh, development of Arctic, uh, Japan's Arctic policy. And uh, we are now pushing forward on the uh, advancing of uh, Japan's Arctic research um, under the new uh, flagship program of the uh, um, ARCS. Uh, ARCS is uh, Japan's national flagship Arctic research project. Uh, it's called the Arctic uh, Challenge for Sustainability, uh, which started in the first phase in the September of 2015, along with the launch of Japan's Arctic policy. And uh, now we are starting the new uh, phase with the Arc Arcs 2 uh, from uh, 2020, which runs up to 2025. Uh, from the on, uh, beginning of our Arctic uh, uh, research project, we have uh, 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 included uh, work of social scientists along by along with the uh, 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 the sort of um, uh, natural science and climate uh, experts and so on and so forth, uh, because we wanted to really bring in our Arctic uh, research, uh, including the uh, uh, in sort of indigenous knowledge of the Arctic uh, region and, and to work with the uh, local communities uh, uh, and helped by the, uh, some of the researchers from social science uh, uh, background. And this one, uh, in this way that we can uh, make the, our Arctic research a very a comprehensive one. And you can see from the beginning of the ARCS uh, one project, there are eight themes uh, that would include uh, uh, some of the work of the social science work, uh, this work in the Arctic uh, uh, under the theme seven, which is uh, people in community development. So these are some of the uh, uh, ARCS one project structure. And, uh, and now we are moving into the next phase of ARCS two project, uh, which includes the four strategic goals. Uh, one is the advancement of the uh, uh, observation and uh, Arctic environmental change. Uh, second strategic goal is the improvement of weather and climate, uh, climate prediction. And the third goal is the impact of Arctic environmental change on society. This is in part with the social science component of it. And then the fourth strategic goal is a legal and policy response on the research implementation for a sustainable Arctic where we come in as a sort of an interface within scientific research and the policy uh, formulation uh, in it. And the two priority subjects, uh, priority number one is the capacity building and research promotion. And the second is strategic dissemination of Arctic information. As Ambassador uh, Suzuka mentioned that we are uh, uh, making our Arctic data available for international uh, science community. And, uh, and also we have uh, under the ARCS2 project, a capacity building component of uh, bringing younger scientists uh, and researchers uh, to, to, to participate uh, actively in international science projects and, and under this uh, uh, program. Um, I mentioned about the new, Japan's new Arctic research vessel uh, last December, uh, the government of Japan decide, uh, has uh, passed uh, the budget to build an Arctic research vessel formally and uh, will start its construction 
uh, this year and then uh, hopefully to um, have a maiden voyage uh, in the um, 2025. And this is some of the sort of uh, uh, basic principle specifications of our new um, Arctic uh, research vessel. So um, we are hoping that uh, to use this uh, uh, new vessel to, to develop a further cooperation with the Arctic research with our international partners and, uh, and I hopefully to contribute uh, in the Ar Arctic uh, uh, science uh, cooperation. And uh, under the uh, science technology diplomacy, uh, where we have a second science advice, science technology advisor uh, at the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, we have been starting to discuss on the next phase of our uh, science, Arctic uh, science cooperation uh, into, under the, uh, 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 particularly with a focus of US-Japan alliance. And uh, our Arctic, of course, was, is in a good area for science, for diplomacy and diplomacy for science, uh, er, and where we uh, uh, highlight on the uh, cooperation of research and observation. And um, lastly, um, I just wanted to uh, mention, as even uh, uh, this morning with uh, Senator Makoski uh, mentioning about Japan hosting a, 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 a Arctic science uh, ministerial meeting this year. Um, as a uh, special advisor, uh, I have visited the White House in 2015 with a minister in charge of science. And I remember uh, then that Dr. John Holdren had formally invited us to the first uh, Arctic Science Ministerial meeting in Washington. And at that time, he had mentioned that uh, Japan should be a host in the near future for the, uh, this effort of uh, global science community uh, tackling the issue of uh, Arctic as a sort of place where we see intensified uh, climate uh, crisis uh, going on. And we need to share our knowledge and, and, and effort to understand the system and the mechanism of this uh, uh, very urgent uh, crisis that is happening in the Arctic. And, uh, 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 and I'm very happy that uh, now we be able to host the third uh, Arctic Science Ministerial meeting in Japan and hope my colleagues from uh, China and, and Korea would also uh, join us uh, hosting in Asia for this meeting. And uh, uh, lastly, um, Dr. Yan and I serve uh, International Advisory Committee for Arctic Circle in Reykjavik. And uh, we are now happy to host the, uh, this year the uh, Arctic Circle Forum Japan. Uh, alongside with the Arctic Science Ministerial meeting. And uh, uh, I have uh, worked, uh, actually collaborated with uh, our part, uh, counterpart in China uh, to participate in the China's uh, uh, previous Arctic uh, Circle Forum in Shanghai. And uh, we are for, uh, happy to follow up on the uh, uh, our cooperation with China and Korea on Arctic research uh, by hosting uh, the, uh, this year's uh, Arctic Circle Forum in Japan. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I'd like to conclude my first uh, initial uh, remarks and thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Tsunami, thank you very much uh, for all of that information. And I appreciate your uh, emphasizing the Arctic Science Ministerial in particular. Uh, we will have the reverse where we in, in the US will be staying up late at night to um, uh, and or rather early in the morning and the reverse of what we're doing now to, to uh, be listening in on that. But there's a lot of enthusiasm for, for that meeting um, which will, will occur in the coming months. And so let me uh, turn to Dr. Shin. Dr. Shin. Yes, Obrey. thank you. Um, okay, that's good morning and good evening. Um, I much appreciate the opportunity to present on Korea's Arctic environmental research and in particular, the way we view the future of the Arctic as a scientist. I may begin by showing where Korea is located relative to the Arctic. Next, please. 
We are a lot closer to the Arctic than you may think. Certainly more Arctic than Hawaii or Miami. Next. Sometimes even more than Moscow. Now, the loosening polar vertex, that is flesh freezing some parts of the Northern Hemisphere, and Korea is not immune from this. Next. This is a photo of a river that I took myself a few kilometers away from my home a while ago. Okay, next. My outline today is like this. Um, this is by no means a promotion of Korea's Arctic research or my own institution, but I meant at an illustration of our approach. First, uh, what does observer state engagement mean? How it could contribute and Arctic policies of many nations that are more similar than they are different. Now efforts and value and how we are feeling and how we are bridging. And then I will finish with summary and future thought. Next, please. Now, six countries were granted observer status in 2013. Remember, this is just one year after the record low sea ice year. And Arctic is the three uh, points. Arctic is simply too vast for any single party to cover or address. And the challenges we face in the Arctic are interconnected and therefore global in nature. And as such, cooperation is extremely important. And I think the entry of the six states signify this. Next, please. And Arctic policies are present for many nations, Arctic and non-Arctic countries alike. But when you read them, it's pretty similar. Science and environmental stewardship and climate change response and international cooperation are all emphasized. And of course, it's no secret that economic aspirations are there on the, as long as it is sustainable and environmentally healthy. Next, please. Now, why on earth Arctic for Korea? Of course, this is a genuine question to Arctic countries and Arctic people, you may wonder. And but this is a, a good question for my fellow Koreans too. Next. Um, as I will say later on, we wish to be a reliable Arctic partner. And because we are not just sitting next to the Arctic, we want to be a smart one. Next, please. If I can uh, try to summarize. OK, Arctic is impacting Korea a lot. And if we can improve the uh, accuracy of uh, projections of abnormal climate patterns sometimes before that should save hundreds and thousands of millions of dollars. And Arctic is where Korean science can become global. And in the Arctic, we can be part of global order and we can be a responsible and respectable member of the community. And Korea is in aerial science dwarfed by Alaska, which is 17 times larger, yet more than 10 times of the whole Arctic population reside in this country, which depend rely on foreign experts for the energy supply and which relies on mar maritime transportation for the export and as, as well as imports. So interest in economic opportunities are only natural. Now, what we do, next please, our research ship is navigating through melt pond laden Arctic sea ice. By far, science is the largest Arctic investment. Next, please. What our ship does, our ship goes back and forth between home and the Arctic, undertaking annual expeditions in design way and in collaborative mode. Next, please. And our field scientists run observations and sampling programs focusing on terrestrial ecosystem and climate gases around the Arctic, and we are adding new science. Next, please. If I can add, um, okay. As such, 
we are becoming very critical link of the overall Arctic observation network. So stay, uh, say on AMAP, AUS, whatever. Well, this is uh, all acronyms. So the collaboration among Arctic and non-Arctic countries are becoming tighter and tighter. The three elements that I'm describing, describing below, not only relevant, also where we are seeking more collaboration. Arctic Ocean in rapid transition, because our ship along with others operating in the Arctic, especially in the Pacific side and the permafrost breakdown and change climate gas dynamics. And it's uh, something uh, that is supported by network stations and field camps and we are part of it. And, and the third, Arctic changes and mid latitudes interactions and impact explored by modeling exercise. This is what we do. And this is what we are pursuing even in a bigger scale. Next, please. If I can put down this observatory investment in numbers, we spend, oh, for example, these three Asian countries spends more than 100 days of ship time and there are more than 100 science crew. And what this investment does is to, to gather the data that you will never be able to go back in time and recollect. Next, please. Now, if we don't use this data, it will be remiss of both Arctic and non-Arctic stakeholders um, to miss out on those capacities. Next, please. Now, this is a photo. I, I, I try to uh, share some of the philosophy's way of thinking uh, that I'm sure with uh, other, uh, other, other Arctic and non-Arctic countries. Next, please. The melting Arctic, a boom and bloom for everyone. And actually this, next please. Actually, this is a photo taken by my fellow co scientists, Arctic flowers that are blooming. Next, please. We don't expect Arctic science to bring us neither a bloom nor a boom, but it can help us to take calculated risk and make use of opportunities more sensibly and sustainably. This is how we view our Arctic science. Next. And as such, warming Arctic will represent an experiment, both natural and societal. Next, please. Uh, as Ambassador Lim uh, uh, explained, what our Arctic policy says, a pioneer and partner in shaping the future of the Arctic together. Next, please. So if I dare to summarize key points of our Arctic endeavors, and actually this is something that I took out from official documentation, but I rephrased it with a little bit of personal taste. Korea sees the Arctic close and connected. Close and connected, a little different from near. Korea has a double ambition and dilemma like others do, conservation and development. And being a pioneer and being a partner is Korea's two-page leaflet dream too. At any rate though, science and technology will remain as key elements. And for Korea, partnership is not just a strategy, but more of a core value. Next page. This is my last slide that I Googled just before I came to work this morning. Now, there are some food dish that may be messy uh, with bare fingers, but you have only long chopsticks. What do you do then? So this is, a photo taken from our primary school textbook. Many hands can make light and easy work, but only when they are willing and when they are supportive to each other. I will stop there. Thank you. Dr. Shen, thank you very much uh, for your uh, presentation and for helping us understand the, the, the deep work that uh, Copri is doing in all of these areas. Um, so uh, then let's uh, move to Dr. Yang. Dr. Yang, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning and a good evening to everyone. And thank you for, thanks uh, the World Center for giving me this opportunity to this prestigious and 
uh, fallen. So uh, uh, China has achieved rapid progress through uh, international cooperation uh, with Arctic and the Arctic states. So today, oh, sorry, I should uh, share. Yeah, uh, I would like to show, uh, to present uh, uh, China's approach for the Arctic research. Uh, uh, as a non-Arctic state, look, China has to organize the uh, Chinari, namely the Chinese National Arctic uh, Research Expedition, as its research, as its uh, 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 instrument for polar research. Chinari uh, is administrated by the Chinese Arctic and Antarctic Administration in, in within the Ministry of Natural Resources and operated by the Polar Research Institute of China. Uh, it is participated about by 80 research institutions and universities. So far for the Arctic, uh, Chinari has organized uh, 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 11 crews into the Arctic Ocean uh, with the main theme on Arctic rapid change and its tele impacts on mid latitude. So uh, I'm sorry, the video, it doesn't work. So I just skip it and uh, give you some brief uh, 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 on some scientific findings. So uh, solar terrestrial interaction in, is one of the main theme of our Arctic research. It's a conjugate, they said Aurora observation system has been established on the Antarctic station, in, in Zhongxian station, in the Antarctic, an Arctic Yellow River station. Which, are, which is on the magnetic field line. So uh, uh, global evolution of polar cap uh, ionization in patches uh, has been discovered. And uh, some new uh, side Alola features has been in, in, I, identified. And the uh, second theme is the Arctic response, responses to global to global uh, uh, warming. Chinari has developed and deployed uh, ice buoys to measure the sea ice drift and the growth melting in process in Central Arctic Ocean. A survey on sea surface carbon dioxide found that the ice-free basin even has higher concentration, revealing that the Arctic basins may not necessarily become the sink of atmospheric uh, uh, the, uh, uh, carbon dioxide as usually expected in, from ice-free condition. Chinari uh, has also found that more and uh, more rapid uh, ac acidification Acidification is occurring in the Arctic Ocean, especially in the Western Arctic Ocean, than the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The tele impact uh, uh, of Arctic changes on mid latitude is another uh, 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 important theme of Arctinary. So the linkage of Arctic sea ice retreat and the mid latitude weather changes have been investigated. So it reveals that the association with Arctic loss of sea ice in summer, East Asia may, may experience more frequent and intense events of extreme weather in winter. Uh, uh, so notice that the Arctic is a, is a, is a, is a place where the, the natural change yeah, and the uh, social development is 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 coupled is highly coupled in the is high, uh, is highly coupled. The both have and the both have global or significance. China 
uh, has incorporated the social science into Arctic research and Arctic social science. As a legacy of the IPY, a research division on social science has established in Polo Research Institute and a research network of more than 60 scholars from 20 institutions for focusing in, on topics of Arctic shipping, law, economics, governance, and geopolitics, and the international cooperation, etc. The social uh, science community has proposed the this, this sea e roads exploration scientifically and economically. And it also increased the public awareness on global uh, uh, connection, on Arctic global connections, and it intensified the dialogues and the collaboration with the Arctic states. Another uh, exam example for cooperation that China has As an example, China Nordic Arctic research has been since established since, since 2012, which now has nine, nine Nordic members and, uh, and eight Chinese members, which is in, in order to increase the wellness and understanding of knowledge and Arctic and its global impacts and to promote cooperation for sustainable development of, of Nordic, Arctic, and a coherent uh, development of China in a global context. Chao is another uh, uh, Chao, the China Iceland Joint uh, uh, Aurora Observatory, is a new model of cooperation in China with Arctic states. So, which is uh, located uh, uh, in the in, in the magnetic spells, plasma sheet, and the ideal place to observe night side Aurora, which is conjugate with Antarctic Showa Station of Japan. And this is not only a for scientific observation, but also uh, a, 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 site, a platform for outreach for uh, Ar uh, Arctic uh, for space science. So uh, without this, um, Dissemination is another important uh, uh, component of our Arctic research. So without uh, uh, dissemination, knowledge will stop at the well it created. So China has engaged young people into uh, Arctic research. Uh, one example is the a Chinese student uh, 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 Arctic uh, uh, Svalbard expedition for the first sunshine of the Arctic, which is carried out uh, in 2018, and uh, we, in cooperation with the uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, no of Norway. Uh, and after that, China also uh, uh, had a dialogue with Arctic uh, public. The Chinari Five, which visited uh, uh, Iceland in August 2012. So research vessel Shilong was open to the public and the two symposia was organized with Icelandic scientists and social representatives. Making fusion with the arts uh, is an uh, effective and, uh, and a popular way uh, in, illuminate, uh, uh, in disseminating of science. So the Polo Sim Nova's movie, Drama, was published with Chinari Corporation. So at, at the end, I hope the, uh, a dance drama can be issued at the end of my presentation. So in uh, a brief summary, by developing Chinari as its scientific instrument, China has carried out Arctic research and achieved better understandings on Arctic rapid change and its tele impacts on middle latitude. By incorporating social science into Arctic research, comprehensive understanding on Arctic issues has been achieved that uh, uh, benefits the informed decision making and the transition in from knowledge to action. Dissemination is translating research findings to, into understanding and action of interested and related people. In responding to the Arctic ramifications, Asia has become an integral part of Arctic research and would make further contribution to sustainable development of Arctic and of the planet Earth. 
as a prospect on Asian U.S. Arctic Research Corporation, there is uh, there is great space for further uh, the bilateral and the transregional Arctic Research Corporation between Asian countries and the U.S. To the so, which include to develop a coordinated and a collaborative observation and investigation on the Arctic, Alaska, and Arctic Ocean within the ASEAN framework. And second, to study the role of Arctic in the global system, its climate dynamics, and ecosystem responses, and tele impacts on mid latitude regions. To understand the value vulnerability and the resilience of Arctic environments and the society, and to disseminate the Arctic knowledge and the challenges to Asian public and bridge the people in the Arctic and Asia. Does it work? Okay, good. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, that really does help us understand uh, uh, China's uh, work in the Arctic. And so, especially since we don't have uh, much time, I'll move immediately to Dr. Kelly Faulkner. Kelly, floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm delighted to be able to join my panel colleagues here and share with you a, a US government and more uh, especially, specifically an NSF perspective. So I probably can't stress enough how important cooperation is for Arctic research, given the magnitude and the pace of environmental and social changes that are underway there, and the urgent need to inform those vexing challenges that come along with those changes. So by the way, in this photo, I am standing at the entrance of a building in 2019 that is used by Chinese researchers at the Nyalison Research Complex that is run by Norway. And I had the good fortune to also visit the um, Korean and Japanese research groups there while I visited. So Nyalison is one of many international Arctic research facilities to which US sponsored researchers can have access under cooperative arrangements. And we certainly welcome uh, our international partners in participating in research at our facilities. Next slide, please. So if you're not familiar with how the US organizes itself with respect to Arctic research and Arctic research policy, it can be very confusing. I'm gonna try and give a quick primer on that subject and NSF's role in the next few slides. So I'll start with US law on that subject, the Arctic Research and Policy Act of 1984 as amended, uh, called for a comprehensive national research agenda in the Arctic and named NSF responsible for implementing this policy with two specific roles. The Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, IARPIC, coordinates US government research and codifies national Arctic research policy and priorities into five-year action plans. IARPIC has always been chaired by the NSF director and currently includes the principles from 16 other federal agencies and offices. So in addition, the NSF director serves as an ex officio member of the Arctic Research Commission, when that's a seven member body appointed by the president. The commission represents interests beyond the US government, including academia, private industry, and indigenous residents of the Arctic. The commission does not fund research, but it does provide recommendations to the US government on research gaps and priorities. And NSF is the only federal agency with an official role in the Arctic Research Commission. Next slide, please. So hopefully all are aware that unlike for Antarctica, there's no overarching treaty governing uh, the Arctic, due in part to the fact that it encompasses sovereign territories, each subject to their national governments. And so this uh, slide focuses on the Arctic Council. We've already heard about it earlier tonight, so I won't belabor that further at this point. Next slide, please. We've also heard mention of the Arctic Circle, which is uh, driven by um, not government, but a comprehensive international public gathering, a fora for, focused on the future of the Arctic. So it doesn't play a direct role in national policymaking or governance. However, its assemblies draw more than 2,000 international participants from all interested sectors. 
So I can come back to NSF Arctic Circle involvement in the discussion. Now I'll turn to other specific examples of how the US has promoted international science cooperation in the Arctic. And as a precedent setting contribution to the US chairmanship of the Arctic Council, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy convened the first Arctic Science Ministerial in 2016. And high level government representatives of 25 nations with research program interest in the Arctic, including China, Japan, and Korea were convened. The second Arctic Science Ministerial was held in Berlin in 2018. And the ministers are pictured uh, on this slide with the NSF director who was head of the US delegation. Both meetings resulted in joint statements affirming the importance of science, collaboration, and inclusion of indigenous peoples in setting the research agenda for the Arctic. And now the Arctic Science Ministerial has evolved into a recurrent gathering of high level science and education ministers focused on cooperative Arctic science opportunities. And we very much look forward to the upcoming ASM3 in May, as, as you heard earlier, earlier is being co-sponsored by Japan and Iceland. Next slide. All right, so to date, the Arctic Council has generated three legally binding agreements. The first two cover search and rescue and oil spill preparedness and are led by the US Coast Guard. And the third agreement on enhancing international Arctic science cooperation was ratified in 2018. I wanna say this agreement was hard won. Negotiations took place over three years. And this is a photo of the US delegation. So I'll point out that Mr. Evan Bloom, then of the US Department of State, co-led oversight of the process with Russian and Swedish counterparts. And the agreement represents consensus among the Arctic eight sovereign nations to collectively lower the barriers to science cooperation by facilitating access to research areas and infrastructure as well as committing to sharing data. And while this agreement remains relatively new, its value should become clear over the next several years as new international research projects and initiatives are implemented. Next slide. Of course, central to NSF's mission is the use of a competitive peer review based process to select and fund the most meritorious science. In the case of the Arctic, the Office of Polar Programs Arctic section does both that and provides logistics and facilities to support science. So listed on the left hand side of this slide are the pro programs in the Arctic section, details for what you can find on our website. In addition, other units throughout the NSF conduct competitions that are relevant and open to Arctic researchers. So for example, there are exciting opportunities in areas of comparative ecology, artificial intelligence, and smart sensors among many other possibilities. And in fact, the enthusiasm across the foundation for advancing Arctic research is evidenced by the emergence of an Arctic focused theme in the cross foundation priority research investments. These priorities are referred to as big ideas. So listed on the right lower part of that slide are the big ideas that cross cut with Arctic research needs. Next slide, please. So zeroing in on the navigating the new Arctic big idea, we have just embarked on the third year of an effort envisioned to last at least five years with a level of investment of about $30 million per year. The NNA big idea complements ongoing investments by the Arctic section of nearly $100 million per year. And then there are several tens of millions of dollars of investments by other units at NSF in Arctic related matters. So NNA is focused on convergent research and education at the nexus of social, natural, and built systems. Co-production of knowledge with indigenous peoples and other Arctic residents is encouraged. And as a brief aside, I'd like to acknowledge that arrangements with local communities haven't always gone smoothly. And we're actively striving to work with all involved to ensure that we learn and improve our ability to foster inclusive and productive engagement to enhance our science and STEM education outcomes in the Arctic. Next slide, please. So for the remainder of this presentation, I'll be focusing on international engagement. One recent standout example was just mentioned, uh, was mentioned by, by my colleague and, and Mr. Bloom, uh, the multidisciplinary drifting observatory for the study of Arctic climate program or mosaic. And hopefully you're familiar with that expedition. It certainly was picked up by the media. And you know, it's really 
uh, very pre precedent setting in many ways. It entailed freezing the German icebreaker Polarstern into the high Arctic to take the closest look ever at the epicenter of global warming. Against so many odds, including the global pandemic and under the leadership of the Alfred Wegener Institute, the expedition succeeded to carry out a full year of intensive observations. That one year of effort took over 10 years in the making and planning. And so fortunately, NSF was well positioned to put considerable resources on the table to help make it happen. And although though the field program did end, the scientists are being supported by us and others um, all over the world to endeavor to fully exploit that unprecedented data set and to gain insights into the uh, Arctic that can help us better understand and predict Arctic and global climate change. Next slide, please. So, as is often the case, the best ideas and most fruitful research endeavors tend to emerge from the research community in a so-called bottoms-up fashion. Mosaic originated in that way. And another example is the Pacific Arctic Group. Now, this group has evolved to become a blended network of scientists and science managers from Canada, China, Korea, Japan, Russia, and the USA. And this group coordinates joint scientists scientific activities in the Pacific Arctic. The existence of this group and sharing of information has facilitated uh, leveraging of research icebreakers toward jointly held science objectives. And the contributions from individual assets as the icebreakers pictured here are combined to create far more complete observational data sets. And importantly, the Pacific Arctic group establishes commonly agreed upon data needs and standards for measurements. Next slide. Major efforts to date stretch from the Chukchi borderland region into the Arctic basin and all the way into the Central Arctic Ocean. And some of the programs uh, to be named include the Distributed Biological Observatory, or DBO, the Pacific Arctic Climate Ecosystem Observatory, and the Synoptic Arctic Survey. And that's a pan-Arctic observational program. So these photos illustrate that the group typically convenes face-to-face -face meetings in association with the International Arctic Science Summit Week meetings, which are annual events. So uh, next slide, please. Like all things, the global pandemic thwarted business as usual in 2020, but the Pacific Arctic group didn't miss a beat. They transitioned to a virtual meeting mode that entrained about 50 participants in November of 2020. Their spring meeting will again be held virtually during the March 2021 Arctic Science Summit Week. And of course, such virtual meetings are greatly facilitated by the well-established relationships that we have been cultivating at face-to-face -face meeting over many years. Um, I'm sure that we all look forward to face-to-face -face meetings again. But for now, we know that we can effectively employ virtual means to enhance our connectivity and our, you know, also enhance participation, as it turns out, and our planning momentum. Next slide, please. So as many of you may be aware, the outgoing NSF director, Dr. Franz Cordova, was very engaged in Arctic matters. And I'm pleased to report that our new director, Dr. Seth Raman Panchanathan, has already made it abundantly clear he will also be engaged. He hit the ground running and laying out his vision for NSF upon his arrival just six months ago. So perhaps most importantly for this audience is the fact uh, that he has a very strong emphasis on increasing partnerships to make NSF ever more effective at its mission. And I can refer you to his opinion piece regarding innovative partnerships in the January 8th issue of Science Magazine for further elaboration. But NSF has long appreciated the necessity of cooperation in the Arctic to overcome daunting and remote conditions. I foresee an increasing emphasis on research partnerships in the Arctic to advance the state of the science. We know we need to better partner with Arctic residents and indigenous communities. We need to continue and to enhance efforts to join forces internationally to achieve the scale of observing and modeling needed. So successful NSF partnerships typically start with a compelling science question or questions and entail a solid basis for true intellectual exchange among partners. Valuable partnerships often leverage access to field areas, facilities, and logistics in order to more effectively advance the research. Next slide, please. 
And very importantly, partnerships must be predicated on mutually agreed data sharing arrangements. In general, NSF espouses open and fair data policies. The FAIR principles help to ensure the greatest possible scientific value is gained from observational efforts. Open data also provides important means for ensuring scientific integrity and so underpins a key core value of the scientific enterprise. We can look to global arrangements for sharing meteorological data under the uh, World Meteorological Organization as one model to aspire to. It's abundantly clear that in that instance, outsized societal benefits accrue by the open sharing of scientific data and knowledge. So making true progress towards more effective Arctic data sharing has been and seems likely to remain an important area for emphasis by Arctic science ministerials. Next slide, please. So in closing, I'll note that NSF typically requires very specific written implementing agreements for partnering in research and research support projects. This has proven particularly important for ensuring protection of pre-decisional information and mutual understanding of commitments. In accordance with the theme of this event, I'm pleased to point out that there are umbrella agreements in existence between NSF and Japan and Korea and China, uh, as noted on this slide. These agreements cover generalities for cooperation to which specific implementing arrangements can be drawn up as new opportunities emerge. And with that, I'd like to thank the Wilson Center for the invitation to participate in this event. And that concludes my remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kelly. I really appreciated that, uh, that presentation. We have five or six minutes uh, left uh, and there are a number of questions that have, uh, have come in. Um, I wonder if I could ask uh, each of our um, uh, Asian participants, uh, in particular because we're getting some questions about how their programs relate to the other Asian programs. And I know that some of you mentioned that in your, in your presentations, but I wonder if you could, for example, Dr. Tsunami, speak to your uh, Japan's cooperation with Korea and China very briefly, um, but in particular, where you see the future of that going. So I'll ask the similar question to, to the others as well. Dr. Tsunami. Uh, thank you very much for that question. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess my colleagues from Korea and China would agree that uh, as we are the observer states, but we are dedicated in Arctic science research and international cooperation. And uh, particularly uh, from, uh, from our side, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure for uh, research can be uh, shared with uh, three countries uh, as we can pull together our collaborative effort and advancing science. As you see, the mosaic is another sort of example of uh, sharing the uh, icebreaking capability and research platform. And now we are building the new icebreaker. And uh, of course, our scientists has been working with the, uh, on, the, on board of the Korean the icebreaker before. And I think we, that sort of international exchange of uh, uh, our platform for research is going to be very important. Uh, including the International Collaboration Site. And also, uh, as uh, my colleague from NSF mentioned, the uh, Arctic data sharing. And I think this is something that, uh, that we'll be discussing extensively, hopefully uh, during the AMS3 uh, discussion uh, this year. So with that, I'll just stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, Dr. Shin, would you care to talk about cooperation with Japan and China? Yeah, I can note that there is already ongoing cooperation, but I should say this is still very much grassroots level. This can be joint use of infrastructure or data sharing, but I would like to see a big picture umbrella, the cooperation among the three countries. I noticed that there are some common words like uh, mid-latitude connections, societal needs, and that kind of thing. So these new emerging themes also can be a target of new cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang. Yes. 
as you has mentioned, that we have already established a, a, a very a, a, a strong cooperation between China, Japan, and, uh, and Korea. So we do have bilateral uh, 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 agreement between three institutes, uh, uh, NIPR, OPRI, and the PRIC. And we are, are exchanging in scientists for our research stations in both in the Arctic and, and uh, in the Arctic and uh, Antarctic on board the ship or and uh, we do have developed uh, uh, FOX is a platform for our cooperation in in, in the Asia region and uh, I agree with uh, Shun that uh, and you especially social science and also uh, uh, like uh, 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 Snami has mentioned, uh, uh, we also have some international uh, 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 forum to collaborate uh, together. Thank you very much. And Kelly, just to close with you, we have maybe a minute and a half or two minutes. Is there anything that you would like to say? I know that in your, your presentation, you talked about work going on with uh, Asian countries, but is there anything about the future of that cooperation that you'd like to emphasize at this point? Um, I hope I made it clear that we very much value the cooperation that we've had to date, both North and South. I think most of my colleagues here participate in both polar regions, but, um, and we all share recognition that we live on one planet. Um, and so I very much appreciate the time and attention that, that our colleagues are paying to, to the research subjects at hand. Uh, I guess the only thing I'd like to close with is just to say that um, uh, I can never forget the 2015 Arctic Science Summit Week meeting opening remarks by Her Imperial Highness Princess Takamoto of Japan. Uh, she gave very stirring um, and unifying remarks that really um, made it clear how important Japan feels uh, the Arctic is to the world. And I would note that I corresponded with her afterwards to let her know that, and she sent me a lovely book she had written called Luli the Iceberg. So I don't know what you're going to name your new ship, but uh, I, I hope you have some fun. <laughs> with it. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, maybe that would be an interesting thing. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> well, Kelly, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of the uh, panelists. They are all uh, great experts and they've all made clear that uh, Japan, Korea, and China, as well as the United States are extremely active when it comes to Arctic science. And with that, I turn the floor back over to Mike Sprague. Thank you, Evan, and thank you all <clears throat> for that outstanding panel. Uh, I say this almost every program we have, we are the, the Arctic's a big neighborhood, but those that live in it and those that work in it, it's a really small community. And as we were watching questions coming over chat, my cell phone had lots of questions for all of you, but the response to your, your panel and the response to the previous panel was simply outstanding. And so I wanna thank you all for touching on the key issues that many around the globe were very interested in hearing from you about. Uh, and thank you to uh, Dave Bolton and Evan for doing an outstanding job on moderating these panels. Tomorrow, uh, we will begin at the same time, which will be 6 p.m. Eastern time in the US in Washington, DC. We have a keynote address by Minister Yoko Kam Kamakawa, who is the Minister of Justice. She also serves as the Chief Secretary of the Parliamentary Caucus on Arctic Frontiers Studies. And we have two panels, one on economic development in the Arctic and one on infrastructure in the Arctic. So we'll start uh, bright and early in, in Asia. We'll start uh, in the evening in Washington, D.C. in the United States and mid-afternoon here in Alaska. I want to thank you all again for participating, uh, for the, our panelists, our experts, uh, ambassadors all. Thank you so very much for starting this two-day symposium off to a very good start. And I simply look forward to continuing this discussion tomorrow. Thank you all again. And thank you for the over 700 colleagues that dialed in to listen and watch us today. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>